Welcome back to the Delicious Legacy Podcast with me, Thomas Dinas. This is part two of our adventure to the beautiful Emerald Isle. We are going back in time to explore the rich culinary history of Ireland with my guest, Regina Sexton. This is part two of our Irish food history. And boy, what an adventure it is. From kings and monks and invasions, we have a rich tapestry of influences that shape the way people eat over the centuries in Ireland. Regina Sexton is a food and culinary historian, food writer, broadcaster and cook. She is also a graduate of Balimalo Cookery School and she holds a certificate in food and cookery. Her publications include A Little History of Irish Food, Jill and Macmillan 1998, and Ireland's Traditional Foods. 1997. What animal is inextricably linked with Ireland and the rich pastures there? What did the fasting monks eat? And what did the poor farmers? How much role the bounty of the sea played in all this? Join me, and together we will find the answers in all the above. Of course, unique place in Irish history and in the collective memory, which goes beyond the shores of Ireland, and it resonates with many people across the world, has the potato and the so-called potato famine in the mid-19th century. Regina makes some very well thought points here, very eloquently put. But that's enough for me now. Let's hear from Regina all about Irish food history from Christian times till the beginning of the 20th century. We've left uh, last week with uh, Regina telling us about the rich grasslands and pastures of uh, Ireland and the temperate yet um, rainy climate of Ireland. So, a bit like uh, today in London then. Um, yeah, so basically, let's go back and um, hear what she has to say about um, the animal that shaped the Irish history more than anything else. Yeah, and so here we go. And this is, I suppose, this is kind of like the story of Irish food, if you want to think about it in terms of tradition becoming heritage continuity. Mm. The animal that we are most indebted to is the cow. And I, I like I, for me, the cow has shaped Irish culture in 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 far reaching ways. You know, I say to the students uh, when they come in first, I don't know if you know or not, Thomas, but the official government uh, logo or sign symbol for Ireland is the harp. Yes. Um, which, of course, communicates our kind of tradition with music and the arts in that respect. But my my suggestion always is that the the symbol for Ireland should be the cow because we're so indebted to what the cow has done for the country. So it's given us place names, it's given us stories, legends, and of course it's given us a food supply and it's given us huge economic income and revenue. Mm. So, and you see, the, you see, the other thing about Ireland that we talked about in terms of environmental conditions shaping at one level um, dietary patterns is that cattle thrive in Ireland. And uh, what we have in Ireland, because, well, before climate change made things a bit more complicated, yeah. um, Ireland is a very temperate place. Uh, we don't have extremes of temperature. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have this kind of set seasonal changes either. You know, like some places would have a summer that's really hot and a winter that's really cold with snow. We don't kind of have that. Yeah. What we have is we have times of the year that are less hot and hotter. So we kind of, it's into this kind of blur of seasonality. And in that context, and we have a lot of rain. And then the, the, the west coast of Ireland is washed by the North Atlantic stream, which gives us a kind of a bit of a, a temperate boost in some areas. Yeah. So what's going on there for Irish, for, for Ireland is that we get, we have a temperate climate and the grass grows all the time nearly. So our grass is growing nearly all year round. And of course, this is fantastic for a dairy, a cattle economy, because yeah. you can have gra- grass, you can have cattle on foot, a gra- a cattle on grass and nearly all year long. Now, that's not what's happening with contemporary, but it's happening to some extent with contemporary agriculture. But in the past, that was a great boon for the cattle economy. And when you look at what we spoke about already in terms of the the the, the, the sources and the, the writings that are coming out from monastic contexts, if you look at those, like a lot of the, lo- the laws have are connected with, with cattle. The cattle are a unit of value. They're used for exchange. They're used for dowries. 
And the other thing is that they're used uh, for, they're the base of a lot of the kind of the stories and the myths and the legends because they were so valuable as units Mm -hmm. of wealth that um, the uh, they were the subject of cattle raids. You know that people would go raging for cattle and taking, (laughs) stealing cattle and bringing them back to yourselves because they were. It was like gold. You know, it was like just doing a bank robbery, really. But instead of raiding the 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 gold vault, you raided uh, the cattle field and you took them. And of course, this is what gives us the the uh, inspiration for the most important and the most entertaining. And iconic of the warrior stories that comes out of Ireland in this period, the Thoinbo Cunha, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, which is a story about the war between uh, Connacht and Ulster, Cú Cullen and May- Queen May from Ulster. And it all centres around trying to steal a bull. Um, and it gives rise to the story of the legendary young warrior, heroic warrior Cú Cullen, and the whole story is about that. And that's just incredibly fascinating. What a story that is. And it's all about uh, a bull because uh, Queen Queen Maeve wants this prize bull that's up in Ulster. And all because it goes back to this kind of dispute she had, pillow talk with her husband <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. So that's just an, that's another podcast, if you like. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that uh, cattle were embedded in the cultural, social uh, psychology and, and um, consciousness of Irish people mm. and because they were units of value and they gave um, young calves, but they gave this flow of milk that could be converted into summertime foods, which they call white meats, bon bia, white food. So we have this huge array of milky things uh, that lasts throughout the summer months. And then, of course, milk being a magical food, you can preserve it. So you can turn it into butter and you can turn it into cheeses, both soft, semi-soft and hard cheeses. With the help of uh, salt, the other thing that the Iron Age sells. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, like uh, that's what I say sometimes up to, I suppose, more recent times when the, the diet has diversified and we're, we're, we, we now have uh, connections with all sorts of food cultures. But if you think about an Irish palate, an Irish palate is uh, coarse, like for your oat cakes, mm-hmm. fatty in terms of the fat content of things like butter, cheeses, um fat from meat and salty because salt was the main preservation agent. Uh, So fatty, salty, coarse palate. And what happens is you have this body of material, Thomas, coming out of Ireland talking about dairy produce, which is staggeringly rich. So they have this whole array of um, dairy foods, not just milk, but milky things and whatever they are, the the method has been lost through time. Uh, It's not communicated in the documents, but various different types of milks, various different types of thickened milks, um, various different types of pouring milks and all sorts of stuff, soft cheeses, semi-soft cheeses and hard cheeses, and then this world of butter. Mm. And this, I think, if you look at Ireland through time, if you want to do kind of broad strokes of continuity and representatives of an of of a genuine Irish culture, you have to point to dairy produce because that will change as well as you go through time. But that's one of the things that 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 is a through line if you want to pull it through time, is the importance of milk. Absolutely, uh, and the cattle economy, I suppose, really. Great, um, thank you for this um, overview of um, that um, pre medieval, early medieval uh, age. Um, so. When we're talking about um, butter and cheese, um, we have um, and other products like, I guess, things like yogurt and kefir and similar to that kind of area, you know, sour milks and sour yogurts and uh, butters, lots of different. Uh, uh, and I think um, cheese wise, I guess uh, you would have your fresh cheeses and you'll have cheeses to preserve and uh, eat in the winter months, of course. So we, we have like countless, I suppose, examples of, of that. Um, and we still have. I mean, I, Irish culture has a rich tradition even today about delicious cheeses. Yeah, and um, well, it, it's another interesting story because it kind of encapsulates, I suppose, kind of almost like the economic and social history of Ireland. What happens is that uh, in that early medieval and later medieval period, we know that the variety of dairy produce that is consumed and in the diet is extensive. Uh, there's one fantastic piece of work, which is not 
well known by any means. Um, it's associated with the monastery of Cork, which of course is where I'm from. Mm. And it's uh, close to where the university is, the early monastery of Cork. But there is a text uh, thought to be produced uh, in that in that in that monastery from around the the 11th century. It would be written now in in Middle Irish, and it's a, a satirical poem called the Ashlinga Mikhanglina. Uh, so Ashling is an Irish word which means a, a dream or a vision. Mm. Okay, it's also a girl's a name, name, but yeah. yeah. But what it means is that you have this kind of dream or vision. It's an Ashling, and uh, and it's used kind of politically uh, as. A genre through time in Ireland as well, but there is this this I suppose source called the Ashing of Clonglina, and it's the story of uh, a monk called Mac Clonglina who travels from further up the country down to the monastery of Cork because he he hears that the monastery of Cork is well known for its educational uh, status. So he wants to come as a young monk and study in Cork, and he walks all the way down from uh, further up in the country, but he meets a very poor reception in Cork. They they don't want to entertain him I suppose and they they treat him very badly and they um they throw him in the river because we have a fantastic river cuts through the the um cuts through uh cork and makes its way out uh, as a, as a tidal river at some point and then goes out into the vastness of the atlantic at the export point of cove uh, in east cork but anyway they put him into the river and they they they're they're not treating him really well. I mean, he's, he's treated really badly. It doesn't sound like it, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like a good reception at all. And actually, we're not like that in Cork. We're very welcoming. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case I'm doing the tourist industry a huge disservice here. But in all of this, he has a vision of a land. That's his Ashling, his his dream, his vision. Mm, mm. Now, the background to this story as well, which I haven't told you yet, is that the uh, King of Munster at the time is infected by a demon of gluttony in his throat. So the King of Munster can stop eating. And that's another story, but which we can't get into. But he can stop eating. So the, the Cork and and Munster is a, a bit in disarray because the king is infected by this demon of gluttony. But what happens in the dream is that um the the, the monk who's come to Cork has a dream of a land made of food. And this is really interesting as well, because you know that there is the motif in European literature of the land made of food. Mm. This is a very, very early example of that motif. So this is a document from the Monastery of Cork, which in fact is just if you if you look at it, it's a list of the foods that are current in this pre-Norman, later medieval Ireland. Yeah. And he then in that dream as well also um will come upon a solution to free the king of his demon of gluttony. So there is kind of rationale to the whole thing and then he's he's set free and all sorts of stuff. So in in that document which lists all of the foods and foods predominantly, I suppose they they focus on, are things like animal products and dairy produce, yeah, and a bit of cereal, seaweed, that kind of thing as well. Uh -huh. But in that, they there's this fantastic reference to all the milky drinks. I am coming back to your point about the milky drinks. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So he talks about milk of medium thickness, of long thickness, of of milk that needs chewing um before you can swallow it, and of milk that makes the horny bleat of the hor horny bleat of a, of a ram as it goes down the gullet. So it's like this bubbling milk, this <laughs> uh, long milk, stringy milk, milk that needs chewing. Now that can be dismissed as being a comic thing, re re maybe, and also maybe is undermining the the relationship that. Irish people have with this dairy economy. But for me, though, I think this is much more indicative of a society that's really well skilled and working with uh, a perishable milk. So I think they really know how to deal with milk and mm. cultured milk uh, to make it consum consumable and to last and to, the, to, to, to have some sort of preservation qualities outside the kind of the areas of cheese and, and butter and all sorts of stuff. So I think this is a society who's well used to working with milk in very different cultured forms. You talked about kefir and yogurt and so on. I think that's what's going on. Mm. But there isn't any detail as to how they go about actually making these items. But I think the knowledge is there, but the knowledge has been lost. Right, right. Uh, do we have we have some uh, butter preserved from, from a bog, right, uh, in Ireland? Am I... No, you're you're correct, and and those um those finds would go back to almost the Bronze Age period for Ireland. And wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the I suppose the other environmental factor about Ireland is that we have a lot of bogland. Um. So when those bogs would have been cut through time for taking turf, peat, a fuel, 
mm. uh, people come across uh, these finds of bog butter uh, that you mention very often. And again, this is a, another story, a story for a, a different day. Very often those bog butter finds, some of them, uh, will be found in association with the bog bodies uh, because we also have another very interesting finds, archaeological finds from the bogs. And these are uh, bog bodies and these are bodies that are believed to have been uh, individuals that were killed, maybe in a um, sacrificial ritualistic way right. and deposited in bogs. So very often the bog butter will be found in association with them. So there is that kind of line up between the bog butter and the sacrificial deposits of bodies and bogs. Mm. But also, I suppose, the other way of thinking about bog butter is a, it's a way of preserving butter if you don't have salt. Mm. Because these finds of, of bog butter, they can be analysed and they don't have salt in them as the preserving agent. And what these attempts uh, at putting butter in bogs is aimed at is preserving it in the anaerobic conditions of the bog. Right. So there, the butter is made and it's either wrapped in something, uh, some organic material. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's wrapped and put into uh, wooden containers, not always. And it's put in in, in the bog. So the, bo the anaerobic conditions of the bog will preserve it. So nobody really knows what's going on here. And there are various different theories. Are they putting it in to extend the life of this fat? And retrieve it later on in time. Mm. Um, it it changes. I mean, if you, but then again, you'd have to test it. And I know people have tested in recent times. They've done experiments with putting fresh butter, in, fresh butter in bogs, leaving it for different periods of time, taking it out and see what it tastes like, and see how the composition and the texture has changed and all sorts of stuff. So we have to think about that. Like, were they putting it in for a certain amount of time? Did they um, did they like the taste of of this product once it came out of the bog because there's a certain rancid nature to it, depending on how you you leave, how long you leave it in there. Yeah. Does it become more a kind of a fat rather than kind of um, a butter fat? And is that fat used for consumption or is it used for other purposes? But th like Ireland is associated with extraordinary numbers of uh, bog butter and bog butter finds. Not confined to Ireland, you'll find it in other parts of Europe as well. But the numbers in Ireland are, 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 are um, I suppose, notable and of, of, of significance. <laughs> now, there doesn't seem to be a lot of bog butter at all mentioned in the uh, in the sources that we've been We've been speaking about so far yeah. the early medieval and the later medieval doc documents. When they talk about butter, they're probably talking about fresh butter or salted butter. And again, like the like the references to wheat and wheat and bread and foods based on wheat, butter is associated with luxury, wealth, and the higher grades in society. It's looked up uh, as being a prestige food because essentially, Thomas, it is literally the fat of the land. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're taking the goodness of the land. Uh, it's being produced into this wonderful fat uh, in the animal. And then when the animal expresses the milk, you're not taking the whole milk. You're only you're taking the richest part of the milk, which is the cream. And you're agitating that even further. Again, you're distilling it down e even into a more concentrated version of fat. You're distilling the butter, the, the cream into two products, buttermilk the residue yeah. and this this lump of fat butter which literally is the gold of the land if you like and yeah it has a, that golden hue as well <laughs> it, yeah it does yeah so and and of course because of that that is economically taxing if you think about it yeah um uh, butter then is is uh, a luxury food uh, associated with again with special occasions and with certain social grades. Mm. I should say as well. I, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we know from the, the 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 documents in this period that Irish society was heavily stratified. Uh -huh. So it goes from a king, a, a king grades to noble grades to strong farming grades down to landless populations down into servoil and slave populations. So it's a highly gradated st stratified society. And of course, uh, food is very uh, important uh, in that society because it signifies, it expresses, it signals uh, status um, mm. in various different ways in, in that kind of traditional agricultural society and economy. Uh, so, you know, things like meats, particularly fresh meat, things like beef and so on, uh, wheat and butter, um, these are uh, these are the foods associated with the the kingly and the noble grades, and these are the foods that you're obliged to produce or to offer up as your food as food rents, food taxes, 
and also if these noble grades call to your house as they're doing their circuits or if they're if they call um to visit your house which they do maybe earlier on the the institution probably dies on as you go through time that you have to feed them according to their grade so you feed people according to their grade not not with what you have in the house <laughs> in mm-hmm. theory anyway this is what what the law tracks are telling us okay so we are in a society which is highly stratified and um so that's pre-roman conquest as well right Yeah, well, it probably mirrors that pre-Roman uh, Iron Age society, but it continues on in Ireland into the early medieval period, if we if we are to believe the mm-hmm. law tracks. And for Ireland, we have the early medieval period goes to the later medieval period. And then we tend to recognise a different era um, from around the middle of the 12th century onwards with the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. Um, yeah, so that then is going to introduce a whole other uh, complexity to, to Ireland. Okay, okay. And so in terms of uh, the Christian um, time, the monasteries and the monks, uh, what was the diet um, in the fast uh, days? So obviously there will be fast days and uh, feast days. And the diet, what was the diet in the fast days? Because obviously, I mean, either way, butter was a luxury. Not many people would eat it. But (laughs) when you were fasting, what you were allowed to eat? So um, the, the... The documents that are being produced or the type of literature that's being produced in Ireland at this point, it, you have, I suppose, material that, that deals with the secular society and that's there the ones written in Old and Middle Irish and all sorts of stuff. But the monks also write about themselves. And they there there's an interesting body of, of material that looks at sort of the diet within penitential communities of monks in Ireland as well. And they're very much, I suppose, focused on Uh, depriving the, I suppose, kind of the s- central tenet of Christianity is that you might control or deprive uh, in this life for reward in the next life. And in that context, a food becomes the vehicle of proving your piety and banking for the other world, if you like, for the next world, for the next life uh, in heaven. So this idea of fasting has different meanings because I think when you were mentioning fasting, you might be thinking about it in terms of the Christian tradition that you fasted at various times in the year uh, or various days in the week. But also fasting is a much uh, broader almost institution for some of the monastic communities because it's something that they maintain as part of their piety Mm -hmm. because they're thinking about their rewards in heaven. Okay, so there are different ways of looking at fasting, I think. Yes. Now, and, and the fasting outside religious communities, so so I suppose we have various different levels of fasting. We have the fasting that's associated with particular days and particular liturgical seasons. We have, and so is, is the secular community abiding by that at this point in time? We don't really know. The ordinary religious communities, are they abiding by that at this point in time? You imagine they are. But then also within The religious groups, you have these communities of penitential monks who look at fasting as something that is more integral and embedded in how they go through their own lives because they're thinking about this heavenly reward. So there's various different ways that we can think about fasting, I suppose, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. I mean, suppose we can talk about the what we know about the monks themselves then, what was their diet on this? Yeah, so now this again isn't an easy question to answer because what happens in Ireland uh, in this period is that the church becomes very much involved in society Mm -hmm. and even more so it becomes involved in the politics of Ireland as well. Because what what Ireland is in this pre-Norman early medieval, later medieval period, is that it's a patchwork of different political groupings in different parts of the island. And what happens is that you might have the local king, you might have a regional king. There is talk of a high king of all of Ireland, which is a contentious kind of area as well to think Mm. about. And within those influential groups, the church becomes intertwined. So, for example, the local king is the king. But his brother, his uncle, his cousin might be the local important uh, figure in the church. So the church becomes integrated into politics and becomes integrated into the upper echelons of society. They are married. Uh, The church is a vast landowner. It's very powerful. 
Um, and it becomes, as I said, indistinguishable in terms of the political ambitions of secular society. So you have that blurring of things too. So in that context, the churchmen will be eating, I suppose, um, with this superior diet, if you like, of the meats, the breads and the cheeses and the butters that we've spoken about. But then you get other aspects of the church as well, which are, I suppose, kind of the more everyday um, churchmen. And then you get the penitential communities as well. Mm -hmm. So it isn't an easy question to answer because you have different types of churchmen in a monastic context in Ireland at this time. No. So the penitential groups, for example, the, we, there is literature coming, coming from these communities where food has huge utility in uh, depriving themselves of pleasure and just in terms of depriving themselves at a very basic level of everyday energy. Yeah. So there's groups of monks who will live this penitential life where food is extremely limited, restrictive, and to the point almost whereby, you know, they're they're almost starving themselves um, because they see this, they see this relationship with food as something that will either merit them well or will take from their piety. So they're eating hardly anything at all. So there is this kind of body of, con and I looked at this actually for some of the research I did because I look, my post-grad work was looking at cereals in the early medieval period. Mm. So there is this kind of body of literature that's coming out from the penitential monks and there's these big discussions on porridge mm -hmm. and gruel and how rich it should be and how thick it should be and how watery it should be and all sorts of stuff. And of course, the aspiration for the penitential monk is to stay alive as long as they can on food that is as weak as possible. It's incredible. Um, and then there is all of these stories about stories of communities of monks that were so starving that um, rich food had to be sneaked in, into their food, like dripping butter through a hollowed stick that was hollowed out. So they were stirring the porridge or the right. gruel uh, with a hollowed out stick that was introducing butter into it to give them a bit of sustenance and all sorts of stuff. Okay. <laughs> so they're eating very little and they're eating what seems to be like a cereal based diet but very watered down and uh, very uh, weak food. And by consequence, you're dealing with a weak community who's living on this euphoria of piety, I suppose, if you like. Mm. So that's incredible, that, I think. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> there's not much I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, me neither. And it, does, it doesn't sound too, too attractive, really. <laughs> so. Yeah, the only thing I can imagine is that reminds me of the monastic or the ascetic communities in uh, uh, Sinar Desert in a um, similar period, really, uh, where mon yeah. uh, monks would live uh, in the desert and they would just eat um, wild grasses and lentils, perhaps. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it seems to be kind of, uh, it seems to be sort of describing that level of piety with that uh, religious aspiration attached to it as well. You know, mm. that the more you suffer here, the greater your reward in heaven will be. Yeah, and trying to be as extreme as possible. It was exactly. like a, an antagonism between monks, who's going to be, or, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, I can yeah. eat less. Yeah, so it could be, I mean, as you say, that's a very relevant uh, uh, connect because it could be it could be the inheritance of that sort of understanding of things as well uh, applied and expressed in an Irish context, you know. Mm. And then you have, you know, you think about some, spectacular Irish monastic sites in Ireland, um, like this, this this group of islands off the coast in County Kerry, like the Skelligs. You know, you, you, you probably have heard of those, Thomas, and one island in particular, Skellig, Skellig Michael. Uh, there's a few islands there off the coast, yeah. um, inaccessible almost, but they became a sort of famous and, and known to a wider audience in recent times because one of the recent Star Wars uh, films yes. was filmed there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a Star Wars fan, so I can't give you the precise detail now. <laughs> but uh, these are these kind of rocks that rise up from the ocean, um, off the coast, uh, in Ireland, in, in off the coast of Kerry in Ireland, and one of them is is Skellig Michael. And you can actually go and visit that. I mean, there's very limited numbers that can go there. You go by boat and you 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 nearly have to jump off the boat to, to, <laughs> to kind of land on the island. And then you climb hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of steps to go up to this uh, monastic setting at the top of the island. Right. And these beehive huts. And you think about, well, what's going on here? Is this a, is this, is this uh, a place of retreat? Are these communities that are living here all the time? Do they have connections with the mainland and all sorts of stuff? And what are they eating? 
Mm. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, and it, like these are these are islands. There's another island which is beside Gaelic Michael, which is a bird sanctuary for things like puffins and gannets. Right. And you're you're wondering, are they consuming puffins and are they fishing and all sorts of stuff? And are they growing their own types of, you know, uh, plant foods on, on this extreme rocky island? Yeah. So there are all of those little local stories as well that raise so many questions about the monasteries, the monks and their relationship with food, I suppose, in Ireland at this point in time. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> I know exactly which islands you mean. Yeah, it's kind of uh, southwest yeah, and it's absolutely spectacular. And if you go there on a good day, it's literally being on the edge of the world, you know, mm, mm, and mm. you're just looking out into the vastness of the world and life, really. Yeah, perfect, uh, perfect setting for a monk. Yeah, yeah, as a point <laughs> of contemplation, you know. <laughs> yeah, but the thing to remember is that, you know, Ireland isn't always sunny, so it's yeah. not a great place to be when the clouds are down and it's raining and you're thinking about what am I going to have for my dinner? <laughs> True, true. Yeah, I mean, so you would you like to move on um, on um, later times? You know, yeah. things change, I suppose, uh, with uh, the Anglo-Norman um, invasions and we have different cultures merging again. Yeah, so we can pick up there if you want, Thomas. Let's, uh, let's do this, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, f- going forward, um, we are leaving the early and the middle uh, medieval island and we're we're going towards our an era that we have more Norman Anglo Norman uh, invasions. I would say. So, uh, like we've been saying, Thomas, uh, during this conversation, that Ireland is this small island on on the edge of of Europe. So people have to have uh, make the decision to come here. So we through time uh, and we have you know the the Christian missionaries coming and settling down and becoming part and parcel of the whole fabric of Irish society. In between that as well, we had the Vikings coming um, to Ireland and they settled down in various different uh, coastal areas like Cork, Waterford, Dublin and Limerick and other places too. But the next big arrival uh, and expansion of culture is during the Anglo-Norman period for Ireland and that starts in the around the middle of the 12th century. Mm. So as you know, the Normans would have come from Normandy into 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 Britain and then they settle down there and then they are, well, the story that we all learn from as we're children in school in Ireland is that they're invited into Ireland to take part in the dynastic politics and disputes of Ireland. So that's what we learn. Uh, and there's an arranged marriage made between an Anglo-Norman and one of the uh, wealthy aristocratic families in Ireland, Strongbow and Aoife. So we have an expansion of the Anglo-Normans into Ireland and they they stay and they do settle down. Um Uh, in time. But what they do is they bring a different food culture with them as well. So we have a strong Anglo-Norman presence in Ireland from Dublin down the East Coast. Mm. Remember, that's the good place for weather. It's the sunny parts of Ireland. And then they start kind of spreading over into parts of Munster, which is extremely rich agricultural land uh, in Ireland. And they go to other parts of the country as well. But the strong Anglo-Norman presence is in the East Coast and into parts of Munster. And what happens is you have the the establishment, I suppose, of an Anglo-Norman colony, if you want, or presence in Ireland. But the faith of the faith of that a group of people goes up and down because you've the Irish recover and they push back the Anglo-Normans and the Anglo-Normans push back and that again. So there's high points and low points for an Anglo presence in Ireland. But interestingly, though, what they do bring is they bring new foods, new ways of dealing with food. Um, and I suppose different meanings attached to different types of food. So if you think about the, and this is really interesting because now what we have going on until we have the the, the, the full period of, of colonization and plantation in the 16th and 17th centuries by the English crown of the monarchy, what we have going on in Ireland up to then is two Irelands. We have a Gaelic island, Ireland, if you like, um, you know, the one that we've just been talking about so far. Yeah. And then we have an Anglo-Norman Ireland. This is another Ireland. And then we have the fusion of the two of them, which is kind of a Gaelic Anglo-Norman mashup, if you want. (laughs) 
Um, and they emerged as a different group as well, a different cultural grouping at some point in time. But I think this is really interesting because up until a more serious uh, colonization process that happens later on in time, what you have is these different cultural groupings and they kind of have different f- uh, food cultures as well. So we have the Gaelic Irish that we've talked about already being the cereal, milky, uh, salty foods. And yeah. then you have the Anglo Normans coming in with this idea of a, a stronger idea of things like how to make bread, how to concentrate on the food of the fields. And I suppose what I'm thinking about here in terms of the foods of the fields are things like a more serious uh, approach or um, a stronger approach to the cultivation of cereals and plant foods like fru- uh, fruits and vegetables and herbs. Okay. So they bring that kind of, uh, I suppose, um, attention to the food, the food of the fields. Yeah. So we do know that there is a preference for wheat and bread amongst the Anglo-Normans because that's the culture they're coming from. So they come with the idea of the built up oven to produce a raised loaf, even Mm. though you can produce it without a built up oven as well in a sourdough system. Obviously, you can do that. But it's a more kind of systematic, organized, um, deeper attachment to wheat and wheat and bread, to maslin breads, to growing different vegetables to growing different fruits, to growing different herbs, to establishing um, herb gardens, kitchen gardens and all sorts of stuff in the estates that are Mm. associated with a Norman presence in Ireland. Do you know what uh, herbs and uh, vegetables are brought to Ireland that they didn't exist before? Well, what they're talking about is they're talking about, yeah, the kind of the, they're talking about, there's a great, um, great source. I'm just looking around to see if I can put my hand on it now. Um, It's, um, a document that was produced in Ireland talking about all, it's a kind of a complicated story because it takes its inspiration from a different herbal associated with England, but it's, it's a kind of a, it's a description of all the herbs of Ireland. Okay. From the, right. from this period, from this kind of period in Ireland. And it talks about the kind of the, 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 the usual kind of garden herbs, like the, the hardy ones like thyme, rosemary but then there's also references to the parsley and i can take that out thomas if you like there i have it just at the side of me uh, and i can have a look at that if you want because all the herbs will be listed in that yeah sure yeah yeah just a second now i have to get that i, I mm-hmm, didn't know mm-hmm. that you were going to mention it but it's just over here on my bookshelf <laughs> two sex so i suppose the point i suppose to to make about an anglo norman presence in ireland is that they maybe have a different relationship with uh, plant foods um in terms of both the culinary and the medicinal merits of foods that can be cultivated in kitchen garden settings or herb garden settings and i think what's interesting here is that you have the kind of the spread of this idea which itself would be would have been inherited from classical understandings of the medicinal plus the culinary value of of plant foods mm. so that maybe is coming to ireland or being uh, reintroduced into ireland these this kind of cultural idea that itself would have come from classical knowledge of these types of foods and so on and I think that's associated with an Anglo-Norman presence in Ireland. So what we do see kind of maybe emerging at this point is the kind of the production of things like herbals or what's and later on in time in this kind of way of kind of Renaissance thinking and so on. It's going back to this kind of idea of gallon and all that sort of stuff. The medicinal value of foods is that these ideas are probably filtered into Ireland in the context of the Norman presence in Ireland. And we have a great document. It's I'm looking at it here now, and um, it's called uh, The Virtues of Herbs of the Master John Gardner, mm-hmm. which refers to um, an outside Irish herbal. But in that, there is a section uh, which is looking at uh, Ireland, and it talks about all the herbs of Ireland. And it's talking about the usual kitchen garden herbs. But what it's talking about here, I suppose, is it's putting Ireland in the context of the herbal as introduced by an, a, a Norman presence. So it's a different way of thinking about food, I suppose, really, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So what they're talking about are things like um, the, the usual potager herbs for cooking, but also references to things like uh, iris, clary, primrose, wild strawberries, water lily, thistle, saffron, and so on. Now, a lot of these will be for for medicinal uses. Some of them will be for culinary uses. So it's just, I suppose what I'm saying is that it's introducing an idea of a different way of thinking about food and bringing that to Ireland. 
Mm. And also probably what they're introducing is a new way of thinking about food in terms of how you work with food in a culinary setting, because you might have, and this I suppose is, is just a suggestion, is that you might have within this norm and presence in Ireland, the introduction into Ireland of the concept of the recipe, you know, a structured and codified way of dealing with ingredients right. to produce a particular dish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's just how they're thinking about food, the ideas about food are going to be very different through a norm and presence and contrast very strongly with a Gaelic approach to food. I think you have two cultures and two very different understandings, approaches, both theoretical and practical when it comes to food. And then you have the meeting of those two groups possibly to hybridise that knowledge as well in some ways in Ireland. Mm, how interesting. I mean, we can that we can kind of understand that <laughs> that point that this happens, this convergence. Yeah. So like if you think about um if you think about Europe at the time and you're going into the later medieval before the early mod- modern period now, if you think about Ireland, if you think about Europe and of course uh, uh, Britain, there is going to be um uh, the circulation of recipes, um particularly manuscript recipes the circulation of them within very small circles of people, particularly from, you know, associated with the uh, courtly food and the food of kings and monarchs. Yeah. So you're going to have the concept of the recipe circulating there. I would imagine that that concept has travelled to Ireland to some extent as well. You have new ways of thinking about food as the inheritance from classical thinking, the medicinal wrapped around the culinary value of food as expressed in the herbals. And then you get new ingredients coming into Ireland as well, which probably supports these new ways of thinking. So if you think about Ireland at the time, there's a very interesting document from a different religious group in Dublin. It's called, it's associated with the Augustinian communities in Christchurch in Dublin from the, oh, it's from the 14th century, for example. Okay. And they're talking about things like ginger, and spices and rice and sugar coming into Dublin at this point in time as well. Of and course. that obviously is on the back of the contact, contact with Britain and a Norman presence, which now is kind of evolving into its own Anglo-Irish presence, if you like, or kind of a hybridization of Irish people mixing with the Norman presence in Ireland. And they're taking and receiving these new ideas that they're, um, they're having from outside and developing a different food culture as well. So we do have things like ginger and spices, rice, mustard, sugar, figs, different types of fruit. And you can see as we're going then into just as we're meeting the early modern period, the sources become more extensive to see how you have the importation of all of these things from Europe into Ireland. And that obviously is making uh, an impact on food culture for certain groups Uh, in Ireland at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so changes happening <laughs> more faster and faster, I suppose, from that period. The Anglo-Normans as well start to set up, I suppose, what we would now remember as as things like a different legal systems, a different system with courts. They set up their, you know, they kind of make more sophisticated the the work of of town and city councils. They expand trading out of Ireland, of course, which is really important. So they start trading items out of Ireland into Europe, particularly trading items like animal skins, not food products so much at the time, some fish, uh, mm. animal skins and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and money is to be made on the back of these exports. Yeah. So the trade with the, the, the trading outside of Ireland is going to go through a boon at this point in time. So I suppose the world is becoming a little bit smaller and then that makes easier the importation of new ideas, new foods, new ingredients and new ways with mm. food in this period too. So early, like late medieval times and early modern time, let's say, do we have on that point the written records of any recipes of this, like you have the form of curry in uh, the court of uh, English kings, for example, do you have something similar happening? We have some similar recipes appearing. This is one of the m- most curious things, I think, Thomas. In if you're looking at the history of food in Ireland through time, uh, there are no recipes mm. that survive mm. or that are extant for for Ireland at this point. 
which is very, very curious because there is a body of herbals, a herbal literature, and these themselves are kind of very close to, um, I suppose, kind of uh, collections of recipes, if you like. So why do the herbals exist and the rest and recipe books mm-hmm. don't? Did they ever exist? Were they destroyed? What's going on? So there is no collection of recipes coming out of Ireland at this point in time that we know of or that still exist. Mm. But if you go back to the records for, um, like I mentioned, the the Christchurch records for Dublin at the time, and there there is just an account. But what I'm what I'm what, what I'm thinking in my head at this point in time is there is an account book that survives from the Christchurch records in Dublin just over a 10 year period in the 14th century. Right. OK, it just survives because this is getting a bit complex now. A lot of Irish historical material was destroyed in a big fire in the four courts uh, in the in the at the start of the 20th yeah. century. So a lot of I don't. I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of Irish documents were destroyed in um, in a big fire. OK, mm. um, but and this document that I think uh, that I'm thinking of was transcribed before the fire. So this remains. So what I'm trying to say is that there's just a very small window where it details the foods that, yeah. have, been bought, that have been bought by the monastery, by, by Christchurch in Dublin over just a small decade. It, it's small. um section of time, one decade. Mm. And in that, if you read between the lines, I think that they are aware of recipes and they must be basing their food and their culinary culture on some sort of recipe-based approach to food. So, for example, if you look at, they're buying a lot of fish in for the fasting days. They're then buying meat in to consume on the non-fast days. So, for example, they're buying things like rice. There's reference to things like almond milk and they're buying white fish. Now, for me, if you look at that from a kind of a culinary historian perspective and they're doing this in a fast day, mm. what they're what they're making there is a fast day blancmange, mm. with, which is based on milk, yeah, rice yeah. and a protein. So this is a new idea. I would imagine that even if they're not working from text-based recipes, they're working from an understanding of a recipe approach to food that is coming on the back of the Anglo-Normans. Right, 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 yeah. If you see what I mean. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, makes sense. In that same text as well, they talk about pies and pasties, which are kind of pan-European, huge examples of a pan-European medieval way with food. And that's working with making a pastry based on wheat for the most part and constructing the the contents of a pie or a pasty in a certain way. That's a new idea with food that you don't find in any of the pre-Norman accounts of food in Ireland. So it seems to be a bit more, maybe a more sophisticated approach to cooking and thinking about food and what food means, expressed through herbals, importation of spices, um, knowledge of sugar as a medicine, yeah. these types of almond milk and all sorts of stuff cordials, importation of fruits from the Mediterranean that speaks of a recipe-based, wider European, medieval way with food that really contrasts with the salty, fatty, coarse diet Mm. of the Gaelic period. So it's two different Ireland's and two different food cultures, I think. I'll be back with Regina Sexton after this short break. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it makes sense, yeah. Uh, do you know, when we're talking about um, salt preservation earlier on, where did they get the salt from? That's a really interesting question um, because there isn't a lot of evidence for uh, the mining of salt in Ireland uh, as a natural yeah. resource. So the options there, I think, are two options. Um, you can produce salt from sea ash, if you yeah. like, um, but that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, and the other, I suppose, the other alternative and the easier one, but it's based on um, having money, uh, is the importation of right, salt. Right. So there are there are references to the importation of salt. Because there are rare examples in England that um, they were making salt from sea from sea water, but that's obviously 
a lot of effort boiling the the water, evaporation and all that stuff. Yeah, and I mean, this is a discussion that we have in the context of uh, meat and how meat is consumed. And this goes back to very practical considerations, I think, Thomas, because a lot of people may not have experience of what happens. Uh, and I, th- this might sound a bit unpleasant, but it's and it's the way that we've kind of distanced or um, disappeared food, I suppose, in many ways. But if you think about when you slaughter an animal, uh, especially larger animals like a cow yeah. or a pig, you have to have a whole system uh, ready to go to be able to uh, collect, to slaughter the animal, to collect the blood, to take out the innards, to butcher the carcass and to separate things like the hide and the bone and so on from the Mm. carcass as well. And if you're dealing with a large animal, like um, a cow or a beef cow, beef cattle, you have to have large quantities of salt at hand to be able to salt that carcass before it spoils and to make it good. You really do. And all of that has to be, all of that has to be sorted out systematically in an organized way that can be repeated every time you slaughter an animal. The same goes for a pig. Mm. So you can't just decide to slaughter the animal and then see what happens next. If you do that, you'll have to eat all the animals straight yeah. away. And that maybe is one of the uh, reasons behind why older communities invested so much in the idea of feasting. Right. That it was a way of consuming fresh meat without the need to preserve but also had the advantage of making these political and social networks when you extended the feast. Mm. Whereas if you go into the whole trade of butchery and butchering animals, that needs skill. Well, it needs the animals, first of all, and the time invested in that. It then needs skill and then it needs yeah. salt. So you have a whole systemic and systematic um, organized exactly. community. And, and you, have the, you have the roots to import that commodity, which is integral to the success of the butchering trade, I suppose, particularly from a preservation perspective. Mm. Now, that gets complicated then in periods of war, scarcity, bad weather. (laughs) And what do you do then? You know, there are all of these practical considerations that would never enter our heads today because we're not, uh, we we don't know what happens uh, when an animal is slaughtered. And now the the butchering and the whole beef uh, industry is so different, obviously, you know, with the scientific advances. But if you think about these communities before you had other ways of preserving, other chemicals to preserve and other uh, technologies to preserve, you had to have all of this system in place. And what happens if something goes wrong in that system? What do you do then? So I think we can't overestimate the importance and the value of salt um, to people and how they would have looked upon this as being integral to industry, to survival, to consumption, and making sure that you had that item to hand. Because if you didn't, you can't do all of these uh, crafts, trades, and then, of course, the associated food and culinary cultures that kind of revolve around it. Absolutely. Excellent. So we are... um Obviously, we can talk uh, forever about these subjects, and we can uh, get into into more details, fascinating details that you seem to have an endless supply of, <laughs> which is great. Uh, but uh, I'm conscious of time. Would you like to move, perhaps, in more modern times and talk about uh, how potato was introduced in uh, Ireland? What happened there? What was uh, the context of of this of the economy then, and the and, and the socio political environment? I suppose. We, we've kind of talked about how important salt was, not just in Ireland, but to people through time. But I do want to bring it back to Ireland again, because the importance of salt is going to change Ireland and change how Ireland functions in the world from the early modern period onwards. Mm-hmm. So we have spoken a little bit about an Anglo-Norman presence in Ireland. And then what happens, though, uh, Thomas, is that the Anglo-Normans were coming to Ireland and they were going to est- establish a presence in Ireland, a strong one. But that goes up and down the, um, through time. But what happens in Ireland in the 16th and through the 17th centuries as well is that the Crown in England decide that this island just over there uh, needs to be colonised properly, if you mm-hmm. like. So you have a period of of plantation and colonisation in the 16th and 17th centuries. And of course, it's not just Ireland that was being colonised. 
now, you know, other parts of the world have been colonised as well. Yes. So what what happens then is that Ireland is brought into this uh, wider colonisation project, if you like. So Britain is connecting with Ireland, but it's also connecting with the new world, America. And of course, that's where the potato is going to be native. Its home is in the Americas. Mm. And once the plantation and the colonisation has been sort of effective in Ireland, and you're thinking here, I suppose, throughout the 17th century, really, is that Ireland now has been looked upon as being some place that can be very useful to the British Empire right. in terms of furthering their empire, their colonisation and their imperial ambitions. And the usefulness of Ireland in that context is in its ability to produce food. And in particular, its ability to produce two types of food, which can be preserved based on salt, and that can be exported. And those two types of food that enter the story as big players are salted beef and salted butter. So from the 17th century onwards, through to the end of the 18th century, into the early 19th century, into the early 20th century for the case of butter, and this is again an extraordinary story. Ireland becomes one of the largest exporters of salted beef and salted butter in the empire. And even more so, to make the story even more extraordinary, is that Cork City becomes the centre point for all of that industry. Mm. So what happens is that, and we spoke about how environmentally Ireland is suited to the keeping of a cattle economy. Yeah, yeah. So what happens now is that that environmental suitability meets commercial ambition and it's expressed through salted beef, corned beef, if you yeah. like, and salted butter. And these are being exported to the new world because the new world has been planted as well with both uh, European planters and a slave population that has been exploited and brought in from uh, Africa. And these people need food. And Ireland is looked upon as being one of the places to supply that food. So you have commodity, salted beef and salted butter being exported. It's also going into Europe, parts of Europe, and the butter is going all over the world, actually, as you go through time. Um, and what happens, which I think, again, is, is just, just such a fascinating story, is that Ireland becomes part of what's called the Golden Triangle. Europe meeting America, America meeting Africa, Africa meeting Europe, Europe meeting America, and over and over again. And for me, this is the first period of globalisation. And in that period of globalisation, you get exchanges of all sorts going on. The exchange of people, the exchange of animals, the exchange of ingredients, and of course, the exchange of disease Mm. and plague and so on. And Ireland fits into that in many ways. And its biggest way is that it's shipping out huge quantities of salted beef and salted butter. And of course, what it will then receive in return, and this is because it's part of the empire now, is that it's receiving the new foods that are coming into into Europe. Mm. These are all things like the tomatoes and the peppers, chocolate coming in, and the big ones, big, huge one, that's going to change everything uh, for Europeans and how they eat. It's sugar yes, coming in from the new world. And for Europe as well, but particularly pronounced in an Irish context, is the coming of the potato from the New World. So in this process of exchange, the environmental benefits of the country uh, in sending out produce sees now what's going to cause, I think, a kind of a turnabout in how Irish people build a relationship with food. As part of that process, it sees the arrival of the potato into Ireland. Mm, yeah. So the potato arrives, nobody knows exactly when into Ireland, possibly in the late 16th century. Some of the earliest references to the, to the potato in Ireland would date from the, the, the first decade of the 17th century. So the potato arrives in Ireland. Okay, pretty early. Um, yeah. yeah, it is early enough, yeah. And by the end of the 17th century, it seems to have been fairly widespread and enjoyed as part of an otherwise diverse diet. So they're, they're, you know, depending on where you are in the country, are you in an Anglo-Norman town? Are you a wealthy Norman person in Ireland? Are you part of a kind of a Gaelic nobility? You know, the survivals of that. Mm. Um, are you living in the West Coast of Ireland? Whatever. So you, there is a kind of a, there's a fairly complex diet going on in all of that. But into that complex diet, the potato, the potato was introduced. And it's valued as just an addition to the diet initially. It's a new thing. 
And then um, it's looked upon as being a good winter food because, you know, the harvest would come out of, the, of, of you know, you can, yeah. ha- you can take the potatoes from, uh, well, you can, depending on the variety and so on. But they're, they're, you can take them out from uh, late summer into um, the early months of the winter. And then it becomes a winter food and it becomes a food, which is really important, a food that will store, yes. that you can keep. Exactly. So then it, it kind of, it becomes an attractive item to, to add to the diet. And that's what's happening by the close of the, uh, the close of the 17th century. Mm. But the story then takes on a different, I suppose, a different aspect as you go through the 18th century, because increasingly through the 18th century, it starts to become more and more and more important in the diet of certain cohorts of Irish society at this point in time. And when it becomes increasingly valuable at what point is is contentious and it's it's debated amongst historians yeah but there's loads of different things that are happening and a lot of them are connected with the um the commercial activities based on food produce as well and the rising markets and the rising value of of exported food particularly butter uh, as you go through the 18th century and into the 19th century as well cork has the largest butter market in the world thomas until the 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 first uh, few decades of the 20th century unbelievable <laughs> it's extraordinary so the the amount of money that's coming back into ireland because of food is incredible and of course what that does is that it affects the value of land and how you're using land mm. because the land is producing food yeah um so that affects all sorts of stuff like the value of land what the land is producing uh, so are you producing for rent are you producing for people? Are you are you producing for the production of food? So all of these complex things start to impact on the diet, particularly of the poorer sectors of Irish society as you move through the 18th century. Mm. And increasingly, the potato becomes more and more important in the diet of one sector of Irish society, and that's going to be the rural poor. Um, certainly by the end of the 18th century, as you head into the 19th century. And that the inroads that the potato makes into the diet is is directly connected with the value of the land to produce food either for export or to produce food things like um, the barley crop, for example, right. that is being that is being used for both exportation but also that's been used for the brewing and distilling industries that are growing throughout the 18th century in Ireland as well. Yeah. And the potato becomes integrated into that because the potato is a good clearing crop. It's used by farmers to clear land between harvests of cereals. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it becomes useful in that commercial world. Then you get a surplus of potatoes that are cheap, available, especially to poorer classes. Then you get sort of the complexities attached to the value of land because of its connection with producing beef and butter for exportation. So you have all of these market concerns, commercial concerns, working away and fizzing that are going to directly impact on how people eat, but are going to make the, the, the biggest impact and influence on the diet of the rural poor as you go through the 18th, particularly the second half of the 18th century and as you come into the early decades of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. So there's all of this stuff that's going on that isn't just food choices, but it's connected with economy markets, commercialization, colonization, the empire, the exchange of goods and all sorts of stuff, you know, between Europe, Africa and the new world. Yeah. And the potato is in the middle of all of that. And it meets particular circumstances then in Ireland where like oats, it will thrive. It'll grow anywhere and it'll grow really well for you with really good returns. It loves Ireland. So all of that is going on in the 18th century in a rural context, in a food producing island, in a traditional agricultural economy still, if you like, that's kind of trying to, um, is is holding its own in the emergence of a mercantile economy in connecting with this broader global kind of developments that are happening as a result of colonisation. So again, another spectacular, spectacularly interesting story that's expressed through food. In this instance, you can trace the story as expressed in one item and that being the potato itself. Mm. Fascinating. And of course, uh, we all know what um, happens next, I suppose. What happens as well, um, just to add another 
another variable into the story is that what you see happening in Ireland throughout the 18th century, but particularly through the uh, the last quarter of the 18th century, is that there is a huge population explosion in Ireland. Mm. The population increases really dramatically. And that increase, that increase, of course, is going to affect uh, food availability, food supply and so on. So you have more people to feed in a limited area, obviously, because, you know, it's, it's a limited land mass. So more people needing more food, a lot of the food, especially for the poor, being determined by market market uh, conditions. Yeah, yeah, so. And as you're heading into the early decades of the 19th century, what happens is that a lot of this system as well was given an extra boon throughout the late 18th century because you had the French Wars and the Napoleonic Wars going on. And as you know, in wartime situations, uh, people can make their fortunes on food yeah. and how food is circulating in a wartime economy. And Ireland is producing a lot of the food to support that war effort, the French Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. And once you have the ending of the Napoleonic Wars, there's an, an economic slump an economic depression right. because of that development in Europe. But that particularly as well um, is going to impact in Ireland because it was producing so much food for the, that war effort. So you have the market economy, the circulation of foods, how land is valued, how rents are increasing, the integration of potatoes into a cereal economy for the various different industries, uh, the war supporting all of that, the stopping of the war, the economic collapse, and you're left with uh, a society where the population has increased considerably in the last generation. Mm. Um, and you were left with a community as well, who, as a result of these changes, had to find adaptions themselves to survive. And part of the adaption to survive in those contexts was to push out some foods out of their diet, like cereals, different types of plant foods, peas and beans, and to restrict their diet and to concentrate on something that was giving good returns and good years, and that was the potato. Yeah. So when you come into Ireland in the 1820s and the 1830s, you have an inflated population of rural poor in Ireland whose diet is extremely limited, fundamental, debased, susceptible to seasonal collapse, and a manifestation or an expression of how bad things were was the extension of the poor law from England into Ireland in the 18, 1830s. Uh, and you have a population, an inflamed, huge population of, of rural poor that are destitute, deprived, impoverished, subsisting on one food, being the potato, and even limiting the varieties of potatoes they're consuming, because right. some varieties are more expensive than others. And they're concentrating on the cheaper varieties. And one of those is the lumper potato. That itself is, gives very good returns in poor conditions. But in 1845, when you have a new variable on the scene again, and that's the spread of, well, it's called a fungus, the Pythophthora infastans, which is the potato blight, mm. the lumper is particularly susceptible to potato blight. And this whole system uh, and food system uh, of the rural poor that has been evolving throughout the 18th century exasperated by condi changing conditions in the early decades of the 19th century, it's devastated and collapses from 1845 onwards when you have the first uh, uh, record and um, result of the attack of the potato crop when it's taken out of the ground in the later half of 1845, and that's the start of uh, the potato famine in Ireland. Mm. And we're talking about the population. For some. The population that was quite big. I mean, uh, am I wrong to think like six, seven million? Oh, it, yeah, well, again, now this is problematic because, um, you know, for for historians of demographics mm. and so on, how you calculate population numbers, but it, it's taken to be around, maybe up around eight million. Oh, wow, okay. Um, at that point in time. And from that 8 million, when the census is taken in 1851, the estimate there can be, the, uh, the estimate for that is that there was 1 million people died as a direct result of disease and malnutrition, mm. and another million had emigrated. Um, so that's between 1845 and 1851. Right. Yeah, extraordinary. I mean, it was a huge population. And yeah, when something goes wrong, like the blight and yeah, the economic conditions, the markets, yeah, suddenly there are going to be problems there, big problems. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know that's much better than me, so <laughs> I'll let you say. Yeah, yeah, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting story as well, where you see that how, um, how market conditions impact on an agricultural society in a colonized context. Yes, yes. Because you can see that today with the a, with a wheat, for example, produced in U- Ukraine and how Polish farmers, they are angry about the subsidies that get the importation of cheap wheat from Ukraine. But at least you have, people can uh, demonstrate and there's some notion of democracy and people, they're not just uh, the poor, the, the poor, f- Agriculture workers, they're not just uh, destitute without any rights. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, th- and I think here, Thomas, always, um, and this is something that is, is, uh, is something that is very important in a contemporary present day context, is that the group that is going to be most impacted by these changes in the markets are going to be the poorer sectors of society. They're always going to be the people affected the most. And you're dealing here in Ireland in um, the middle of the 19th century with a poor population who have been, who who have had their food culture eroded by the increased presence of the potato in their diet. And, you know, the erosion of knowledge, the erosion of skills for very good reason you know, because they were adapting to the conditions they found themselves in. Mm. But they're going to be the groups that are most impacted by the spread of blight uh, from 1845 onwards. You know, so it's the poor who are always, always going to, who are going to be affected the most. And when this is important for us today to consider, I suppose, for all of us to consider, you know, in terms of how we make our food choices, when you think about who is producing the food that we eat, from what parts of the world is this food being produced? Yeah. Uh, how has it impacted on the societies where the food is being produced? And I'm thinking here, I suppose, in a different way, I'm thinking about, you know, the north of the, the globe and the south of the globe mm. and how, again, it's the poor, particularly in the southern regions of the planet, that are most impacted by our commercial decisions uh, around food and food production. And ultimately, the choices that we can make and the luxury of making those choices today. Yeah. So, you know, things sometimes change, but sometimes things don't change. Uh, like, you know, the poor in Ireland in the 19th century were part of this globalised system of food production and how it impacts in the various different groups. I mean, some people in Ireland really benefited from these connections because their their diets diversified. Uh, there was money to be made on uh, the commercialization of the food industry at this point in time. Yeah. They had access to a wide variety of ingredients, um, sugar being one of them, like we spoke about. But then there are other people that that don't have the luxury to make those choices and they suffer the most. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And yes, yeah, this poor in the global south now, they're still suffering for similar problems in, in an even more complicated um, food network with prices dictated by a completely random person in some stock exchange <laughs> in New York or Chicago or whatever. And yeah, we, we, we still have the same dilemmas, like somebody who's growing cattle in Brazil and they export it. And they eat it in, I don't know, Canada or UK in some fast food restaurant. That has very big impact, obviously, on the environment, but also in the lives of these people and maybe ingredients such as palm oil in Indonesia and all, all that stuff so global and yet the impact f- is is felt on the poor people who are actually producing this working to produce this this food and i suppose yeah that goes back maybe to our very first point uh thomas you're talking about how food studies has become such a pertinent and important issue mm. because you can't now talk about any dish any one food ingredient because the entanglements that are connected to every aspect of food in a contemporary day context leads you down into this rabbit hole of complexity of politics, of economics, of vested interests, of exploitation and so on. Yeah. You know, you can't just, you just can't mention one thing. <laughs> you can't talk about chocolate because, you know, it's connected with palm oil. It's connected with exploitation. It's connected with stock markets. It's connected with so many things, you know? Yeah. So where do you start? Where do you finish? So that's why it's so important, I think, that we do need to have people informed about food and food choices. Yeah. 
and the consequences of all of those in a big global way now, because the, the world has got so much smaller, but so much more complex. But I still believe that people have power within that if they're informed to make kind of informed choices, if you like. Mm, yeah. But it is very complex and it can be overwhelmingly complex. Yes. If you, if you just uh, see it as an individual and um, just trying to solve it uh, on an individual level, yeah, it, it's, it's overwhelming. But um, I think like that, if you, if you have a system that people in general are more informed and they have that ability to, to work together towards um, a better goal... Uh, f- mm. then yeah I think there are positives to to get out of uh, we haven't talked about any um, maybe some classic traditional um, Irish foods that um, we don't know nowadays at all do you have anything to tell us on that I suppose I have um, some examples that I that, that I particularly are fond of myself I suppose because they tell an interesting story yeah. so I, I think if we take Maybe the story of bread, Thomas, mm-hmm. for, for Ireland. I think that's really interesting because it cuts through various different themes and topics like we've been speaking about so far. So the first one I nearly mentioned earlier on in the talk was oat cakes. Yeah. And they were so important and they're so prevalent. And they were uh, like a symbol of this Gaelic way with food, if you like. And nowadays they've almost disappeared. <laughs> Certainly nobody is making them at home or or they would be a rare thing to make at home. And commercially, there's there's only about one or two lines of oat cakes in Ireland. What that story is, is that the story of food in Ireland is is sometimes the story of foods that were important and then foods that disappear or foods that were important declined and then kind of reemerge again, like the cheeses, for example, that we spoke about. Yeah. So if you take the story of bread, for example, oat cakes... Nobody would kind of say, oh, cakes are Irish. They might say they're Scottish. (laughs) But then people might say, oh, soda bread. That's really traditional for Ireland. Right. But then when you think about soda bread, it brings us back actually to the 19th century. And soda bread is really recent in the general continuum of time now, I mean. Mm. Soda bread is a very recent addition to Irish food ways. And what happens, we spoke about the potato and the famine. What happens after the famine is that society changes in many different ways. Agriculture changes, the infrastructure of Ireland is improving. You know, generally speaking, there's advances in technology and science and in the food industries. Ireland is open up to kind of free trading markets in a, in a greater sense. There's less people in Ireland, there's more money circulating and all sorts of stuff. And into that, And I suppose essentially what I'm saying is Ireland meets modernity for a lot of people in the second half of the 19th century. And it's in that period of commercialization and modernity, you have the emergence of a traditional product in engagement with modernity, which is such a kind of a complex, interesting, almost contradictory kind of thing. (laughs) So if you think about soda bread, for example, the oat cakes were being abandoned. The potato took their place. The sourdough system was in place for some people who had access to wheat and the skills and so on, or even bakeries and and, and the money to buy baker's bread. Yeah. But then what you see happening at the, at the end of the 19th century is that Ireland is opening up to the free market trading world. Wheat has been imported fairly cheaply from places like the Americas and the Balkans. And you have a kind of um, a big upsurge in the consumption of baker's bread made in bakeries. And women at home having the ability to make soda bread very quickly it, with limited ingredients to hand. Mm. Wheat, buttermilk, wheat and flour, buttermilk, and this product of science, bicarbonate of soda, <laughs> where they can make a bread that doesn't need um, yeast or a sourdough system. It doesn't need time to ferment yeah. and rise and knock back. You mix the ingredients together. You hardly mix them at all. It's finished. You put them in the pot and within... Half an hour, 40 minutes, you have a fresh bread every day. So you have oat cakes disappeared because of potatoes, potatoes causing a famine, a famine bringing this kind of modern way of life yeah. and engagement with modern food systems to a lot of people in Ireland. An expression of that would be the emergence of soda bread as a traditional ingredient that we look upon today as being almost symbolic of Irish yeah. food ways in many ways. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> And then the other one, I suppose, that kind of is within that pattern of a popularity decline reemergence is the cheeses that we spoke about. Mm. 
So we spoke about the Ireland being awash with milk and all of these milky foods. All of the cheeses decline as well mm. uh, in the early modern period because the the substance of milk is going into the butter making industry. Yeah, yeah. So you do get isolated pockets of cheese making, but the cheese making tradition dies out and disappears. And then in the 1970s, well, you get various different little pockets and so on. But the, the big development in the 1970s was you had the emergence of a farmhouse cheese making and a cheese making industry in Ireland that today has kind of grown into a whole population and family of superlative high quality farmhouse cheeses that have won international awards and so on. And for us, our representatives, the first representatives, I suppose, of an artisan food community, an artisan food industry where food is made to ethics and philosophies that are outside mainstream patterns, I suppose. Mm. Those cheeses don't have a connection with the early and later medieval cheese making tradition because we don't know what those cheeses were. Yeah. But I suppose what it does speak to is it speaks to the continuity of the cattle economy and the quality of the milk that, that Ireland can produce, I suppose. And then the ambition and the skill of small farmers, many of them new to farming in the 1970s, yeah. making cheeses in their kitchens on the top <laughs> of the stoves that it would have then developed into businesses and very successful businesses that survive to the present day. But again, just a, a superlative food that's based on milk, essentially, I suppose. Yeah, tell me a bit about the fish uh, in Ireland, because obviously it's an island surrounded by sea and so many beautiful rich sea, sea, sea waters and fresh rivers as well. It, w one of the things I say to uh, students, trying just to get them to talk, I say to them, uh, one of the first things I ask them to think about is if you were uh, an alien, Uh, coming into this planetary system and you had a look at Earth and you looked down and you saw Ireland and you, you might be an alien in your alien spaceship and you might say, oh, I wonder what kind of food th those people have down there in that place. And all of the aliens in their spaceship would say, oh, they have lots of fish and shellfish. And then the aliens would arrive in Ireland and they'd find no fish dishes, right? <laughs> so you kind of go, what's going on here? Why are these people surrounded with water, sea, the seas and the whole island indented with fresh waterways why are they not eating fish mm. and it's one of the big enigmas in the story of Irish food I think and like we spoke about the Mesolithic where one of the 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 from the evidence that we have one of the big components in the diet in that prehistoric period was freshwater fish and 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 marine sea life sea, sea seafood and then And then you kind of go, what happens next? And it seems, Thomas, that at some point in time that the value attaching to different foods moved away from the sea mm. and moved to the land. <laughs> and the value was attached to meat. That meat was the valuable thing for farmers and the valuable thing to consume with all its meanings. Right. Even if you look at the medieval period, though, one of the big industries out of Ireland in terms of trading was fish and salted fish. What we might think about is things like bacala, you know, that you find in the Mediterranean yeah. countries from um, from France down to down to Italy. And from the medieval period, a lot of that fish that was being consumed in what's called the Catholic Highway, mm. that they were consuming the salted fish because of the fast the fast days, yeah. that was coming out of Irish waters, and it was either fished by the Mediterraneans, particularly the Spanish, or else it was being produced in Ireland and exported. This stock dried fish, right, right, but. What happens in Ireland is that there's this value attaching to meat above fish. And also what happens is that because the infrastructure of Ireland is, is not great until you come into the, the 19th century, is the exportation or the, the circulation of fresh fish around the landscape is problematic. So you can't get fresh fish from the coastal areas into the inland areas. Mm. So what people are consuming for a lot of time in Ireland is salted fish. And because Ireland is a Catholic country, particularly very strongly observant, I suppose, in Catholic duties and ways from the 19th century onwards, they will uh, uphold the kind of the, the obligation to fast on Fridays, maybe to fast uh, during Advent and Lent yeah. and to fast before the celebration of communion and mass. And what they're consuming in those days is fish, but they're not consuming, if you're not on the coast, what they're consuming is salted fish. Yes. Heavily salted fish, which people really don't like because it tastes more of salt than fish. <laughs> 
it has to be steeped and it has to be taken out of the water, steeped again to get all the salt out of it. And then when you cook it, it still tastes like salt. (laughs) So there's this thing about fish that it's really peculiar for Irish people. They associate it with fast days. They associate it with salt. And then they associate it with bones, that if you eat fish, there's going to be loads of bones in it. And, you know, as children, we were always kind of schooled and be careful when you're eating fish because it could choke you and kill you. (laughs) So there was that danger of eating fish. (laughs) But that's, I, I suppose, that's for many people. But then when you go along the coast the coastal areas of Ireland, there is a very strong tradition of eating fish that we don't hear an awful lot about. Eating fresh fish, eating shellfish and all sorts of stuff. And curiously though, a lot of that very fine produce, especially like the shellfishes, for example, they were, and again, it's part of the peculiarities of Irish history, they were associated with poor people and times of want and times of need. Mm. That if you didn't have the money to buy meat, you weren't a strong farmer. You couldn't go to the market. You had to go and access food for free. And a lot of that was sort of foods that you could pick a lot, pick up from along the coast. Seaweed, shellfish, yeah, some fishes that are closer to the land areas and marine areas. And those kind of were stigmatised to some extent. And they were associated with poor people and people who didn't have the economic wherewithal to elevate themselves out of the situation they find themselves in. How fascinating. So you have this kind of coming together, this cluster of things like a lot of fish being used as a commodity for export. So you got the money from it rather than eating it yourself. Associated with poor food ways, want, famine, types of need, the association with the church, the association with salt and the kind of the the turning away from that kind of food because you didn't like it. The inability to deal with fresh fish and cook it properly. You know, is it cooked? Isn't it cooked? Will it kill me if I have a bone stuck in my throat? So you have all of this kind of fusion, a cluster of things, which made people very, which made Irish people have this very strange, enigmatic relationship with fish. Um, which is very peculiar, but also very interesting. Now, of course, that's changed in recent times and Irish people are eating more fish. That's good. Um, and, and they're consuming it because they, you know, they cook it differently. They might have more knowledge about how to cook it. And they're also aware of the, the health benefits, mm. I suppose, of, of consuming fish and shellfish. But still, in Ireland, you'll get people who are very, very suspicious and very reluctant to eat things like um, periwinkles or even oysters. Right. That, you know, there's this kind of element of disgust as well associated <laughs> with that type of food, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> So it's a very complex, very interesting other little case study, a nugget, case study nugget that kind of uh, unfolds a whole story of, uh, of Irishness and Irishness attached to food ways and food culture, I suppose, really. Thanks, Thomas. I hope that was okay now. How fantastic. Um, That's a fascinating conversation and we can go for hours, but thank you so much for your time. And uh, we can um, end here, I suppose, with uh, these two fantastic Irish produce. (laughs) Thank you very much. And as an extra, extra bonus subject, I have this unique uh, meat blood preparation from Cork. Let's find out more. One of the interesting um, meat-based products from Ireland, it's called Drisin, and it's a pudding, a type of black pudding. And um, the special feature is that it's a unique preparation of animal bloods and made all in Cork and the surrounding counties. And this is a little teaser from uh, the extra bit for Patreon backers only. And this is all from Regina Sexton. I hope you find it very informative and inspired you to cook some traditional Irish fare. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review or rate the episode on Spotify, Acast, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and wherever else you get your podcasts from. Also, share this episode with friends and family. And uh, please consider being a Patreon supporter and subscriber there so you can get all the episodes early and ad-free with additional bonus content. Your support means a lot to me. And of course, on Patreon, you will find also some uh, bonus recipes, some other texts, and perhaps some new videos that I'll be making. 
in the next uh, few months. That's all for me now. This was uh, Season 4, Episode 30. And I'll be back very soon with Season 5 and more archaeogastronomical adventures. See you soon. Bye.